You know, not many women on this planet can claim that they dated Brad Pitt in high school, but our guest this week, oh, she can do just that, or at least she did so playing high school student Maria on a very special episode of the show that she starred in for several years, Head of the Class. She is Leslie Ray Bega. I am Jerry Strauss, and this is The Laugh Track. Do you need your weekly comedy fix? Relax while we visit the sitcoms you love, the jokes you remember, the characters you will never forget, and the stars that bring them to you. Sit back, it's The Laugh Track with Jerry Strauss. Hello again everyone and welcome to The Laugh Track with Jerry Strauss. He is I, I am him, and we are all here together for another great edition, another great conversation. And we're going back a little further this time. We've been kind of 90-centric lately, haven't we? A lot of great shows from that time period that we've been speaking with the stars of. But we're going back just a bit further to the late 80s. The show was called Head of the Class, a group of gifted students coping with their maturation, if you will. Coping with teenage life, high school life, and of course heading into adulthood, all held by their teacher, Mr. Moore, the great Howard Hessman, a sitcom legend, and then later on by Billy Connolly, another comedic legend. Uh, A great show. All those of us who remember it surely do so fondly, and we spoke to one of the stars this week. Her name is Leslie Ray Bega. Man, I certainly remember her growing up as one of my all-time crushes in my teen years, and it was cool to catch up with her, and what a cool person, cool stories. The episode she selected that we deep dive into this time out, super cool because it actually features one of the very first TV appearances ever for one Mr. Brad Pitt, uh, whom Leslie, her character Maria, actually dates throughout this episode, so lots of cuddling and smooching, and uh, a lot of uh, good memories, I'm sure, for Leslie and for Brad Pitt as well, you have to imagine. Some other great insights into the making of the show, and just a very eclectic career that we delve into as well, so fasten your seatbelts, this one is all over the place in the best way possible, it's Leslie Ray Bega from Head of the Class, here on The Laugh Track. So we are here, we are conversing, we've already been conversing, so we're going to let you guys know that, but we're here, and she is here. Of course, I'm talking about Leslie Bega, Leslie Ray Bega, to many of you, we are just talking about that. Leslie, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I'm great, it's great to connect with you, it's great to, to chat with you. Before we go anywhere, Likewise. you've got to tell the story. We, we got on the line and I said... Do you prefer to be referred to these days as Leslie Bega or Leslie Ray Bega, which is how a lot of the more current things about you online, they refer to you with the middle name as well. And so tell me the story of where this middle name entered the picture. Well, it's it's uh, one of those turning lemons into lemonade kind of story. Uh, fan, he was a fan in Australia. He had stolen my domain name. LeslieBega.com because uh, he was a fan and <laughs> he he said he would give me my domain name if I gave him twenty thousand dollars cash and I said you know hard, pretty hard to travel with cash like that because he <laughs> he wanted it in cash and he was in Australia and Not at uh, all, he Jane. said well I'll nah, you think. So he said, "Well, I'll I'll come to uh, I'll come to L.A. and meet you." And I said, "Really?" I said, "Where would you like to meet me?" And he said, "Well, at a motel by the airport." <laughs> I thought to myself, "Well, that sounds like a safe choice." So I said, "Sure." I, <laughs> I love that it's a, why not? I love that it's I love that it's specifically a motel, not a hotel. It's got to be a motel. Oh, it was a motel. He specifically <laughs> said motel. <laughs> Very clear with that one. And I said, why don't you go ahead and, and buy yourself a first-class ticket while you're at it because you're going to be getting so much cash. And, uh, and he, he was very excited. And, you know, with all this great vigor, he got his plane ticket and confirmed when he would be arriving. And I said, sounds really good to me. Just give me a call when you land. And 
and I'll meet you at the motel and with your suitcase of cash. And he landed and he called me and then he called me again. And then he called me again. And by that time, I had already bought LeslieRayBega.com because he didn't know my middle name. Right. And, uh, and he kept continuing to call me, and his messages included, I want you to blog for me. I want you to do work for me for my new LeslieBega.com website. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the rest is history. It was basically LeslieRayBega.com from, them, from then on. <laughs> It's, it's Which has the gone biggest, through many transitions. It's the, the biggest catfish of all time, Leslie. I'm, I'm a little disappointed in you. That wasn't very nice, you know. <laughs> no. Wasn't nice of him either. No. <laughs> what a Listen, lesson. Listen, had, had, it, had it been a, had it been a, a, a completely legitimate um, transaction and had he requested maybe a more um, reasonable you know, compensation uh-huh. for the for the domain name, name. I I probably would have considered it, and I probably wouldn't. But he'd made some pretty shady demands, and I just felt like you know, with shady characters, karma kind of sets itself up for itself, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, I think most reputable business people typically take a check or PayPal or something like that, as opposed to um, flying halfway across the world to meet you at a, an airport motel. So I think you made the right call. <laughs> yeah, I believe so. And and I think that sometimes, you know, when you have a, a transaction with a reasonable, logical, rational request for payment, for, you know, being smart enough to steal someone's name ahead of time. I think it just becomes a typical business transaction. It has to be reasonable, you know, and it has to I, be safe and legal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the, n- this was none of those things. So, <laughs> but, yeah, that, but it's a great I do, story. I do business, on, I do business on, this, on this straight and clean road. Yeah. <laughs> well, you could probably sell this story and it could probably be turned into a treatment for a, a lifetime movie somewhere down the road. So that'll be of value to you perhaps someday in the future. <laughs> I have but, tons of stories that would completely blow your mind and baffle you. Well, that's what we're here for. But we're also here to talk, of course, because that's what we're about here on the Laugh Track. We're here to talk about Head of the Class, which is you know, one of my favorite sitcoms from back in the day, from my formative years, so to speak. What a, what kind of a role in your career and in your life is head to the class for you? Like, when you look back on it now, is it something that you look at as a highlight of your career? Since you've done so many different things since then, is it still something you look back and think about a lot? You know, it's interesting. I think it's just part of the architecture that compiles everything that makes me who I am, as an artist as well. Because during that time, I was a cinema major, a drama minor. I was reading the great playwrights from Ibsen, Chekhov, Eugene O'Neill, Strindberg Shaw, Tennessee Williams. I was doing Shakespeare in the Park for free. And I really took the creative and artistic integrity of my craft very seriously. And here I was presented with a sitcom that I'd never fathomed in my life doing. And it expanded my creativity. You know, a lot of people looked at it dur- during that era. Um, sitcoms were pretty much looked at. They were categorized in a certain realm. And nowadays they're not. Nowadays it's it's basically you can bounce from one thing to the other. You can be Adam Sandler and bounce to some great dramatic roles or some great comedy. But during those days. I'm not going to age myself and <laughs> tell you, but it was, you know, during, during the late eighties, early nineties, I think people had, um, and I, and I'd studied all over the world. I'd been, I, I still do take my, my craft very seriously worked with one of the great masters of our time, Larry Moss for the last 30 years. Um, and absolutely loved devouring the great, playwrights and their stories and but uh, the sitcom actually expanded my creativity and put me into a, a different category than I never thought that I would be able to do and it's that interesting was the fun thing about it 
Yeah, this show really is very much about that because I think that for most of us, and certainly, you know, back in those days before sitcoms kind of maybe evolved more consistently, people thought of sitcoms as like a lower class of comedy, a lower class of entertainment. I think that's what you're alluding to. But this show is about looking back at those sitcoms, whether it's more recent or back in earlier times, and looking at what they really are, which I believe is the perfect combination of television and theater for the live yeah, performance. Yeah, they've become iconic. Yeah, they've totally, they totally are. Um, there's a word for it. What is the word I'm thinking of? It's kind of like going back and watching Rocky Horror Picture Show in a theater. Uh-huh. It's one of those things. It's, it's yeah. one of those kind of moments. You yeah. know, and um, I know there's a word for it. But, I, I, yeah, and, and if you actually look at a lot of the sitcoms, like Friends, they're if they're really well written and they're really well done, it's genius within its own right. Seinfeld, and if it's portrayed in the right way, they're so well done and they can be so funny. And um, and you have to be a really good actor to be able to stretch yourself in order to do different types of characters in different realms of work. You can go if once you've done a sitcom. Once I did once I did head of the class, I realized, oh my gosh, I can go do a farce like Tartuffe, or I can go do, I could really go do anything at this point. I I was thinking my my whole mind frame was opened up. I was thinking in in this dramatic, I was basically transitioning from drama and dramedy into, you know, theater comedy. I'd done a lot of theater. That was that's my main love, and that's what I did a lot of growing up and musical theater. And I had a blast. Head of the class was a blast. You have to look back at, at those days and go, wow, you know, what a, what an incredible time did you, uh, in my journey. In essence, it's almost like a balancing of performing for the cameras, but also performing in front of a studio audience. So does that aspect of it, the part where you're performing to try to get the right reaction, the right laughs from those people who are there in that studio audience, is that something that you had a comfort level with because of your theater background? Absolutely, because it's all, it's all about navigating that proscenium arch. And when you understand that, you can go into any tier of that arch that you need to. In the theater, you're constantly working the outer realms of the of that arch because you, you have to, especially because of your vocal and your articulation and everything is so spontaneous in the moment and you do not get another retake. That helped me immensely because you you rely you fall you can you can rely on yourself and trust yourself and your talent enough to fall back on your creativity if something doesn't go right you can catch it and turn it into gold i think that's when some of the the best gold happens let's just set the stage for those of you who may not have watched head of class back in the day or maybe are hearing about it on this show for the first time head of class a popular sitcom um it was a classroom sitcom and you know looking back on it and its place in tv history if you will i would put it almost as a predator not a predecessor what's the opposite of predecessor as a successor in a way to a show like welcome back cotter from the 70s which was a classroom show about a class of underachievers this was a about a class of overachievers and it was like that show us an ensemble so you were a part of that class and part of a very talented cast that all got to kind of share the shine at different points during during the series. At the same time, I would say it was kind of a predecessor to a show like Big Bang Theory because I feel like Head of the Class went a long way in showing the world and especially showing teenagers that being smart, being advanced, being cerebral, if you will, they were still people. And that was at a time when the quote-unquote nerd movement was about caricatures and about you know, a negative look at that type of kid or that type of student. But you guys were real people who had real well-rounded problems just like everybody else. Absolutely. And um, 
And I think now it's become one of those cult classics. At the time, we didn't understand what it was going to become. And I think it was a little ahead of its time in a lot of ways because we would address topics that not many sitcoms would address. And I remember even saying to the writers at one point, hey, can we do an episode that, that addresses the controversial situation between the Sandinistas and the conscious and the history of that, because the main teacher in the show was a history teacher. So we would always throw out, and, and I kind of came from that world. I, I was valedictorian of a private French school I had been at for 12 years, and I just came out of that whole world, so I understood it very well. Pretty much a complete nerd growing up, and it, it was amazing that the producers were so open to taking so many of our ideas and running with them. I remember one time, and this could have been a, a, an episode to feature, but I remember one time a girl, one of the girls and I, Kimberly and I, went to go, we went to Westwood. That was when Westwood in L.A. was a big place to walk around, and they had this crazy music sound booth. And we went in to sing, and I think we sang Let It Be by the Beatles, and I... I was getting such a kick out of it, and I played it for the producers, and the producers went, you guys have really great voices. And they created a musical because of that, and our class did the musical Little Shop of Horrors, just because I had played them something fun and kind of quirky that Kimberly and I had done in Westwood, <laughs> um, recorded in Westwood. And, and then I, got a, I remember getting a lot of letters saying, that's not you singing why, you know, how, how could you be a fake like that? And it was us. It was all of us singing. And Rain Pryor was on it, and it was all of our voices. And I guess it just happened to sound really good. But if you think about the talent that comes out of those schools, I mean, the talent that comes out of New York City, I mean, anywhere. Elton John, you know, came out of out of a music school in London. And, I mean, and I think the English wiped the floor with us as actors anyway. I just think they're absolutely <laughs> brilliant. But no, seriously. Um, but there's so much talent out there. And I think, I think that's what made everything. I think that the producers having such flexibility in their ideas and not being narrow-minded just made the show what it was because we were constantly throwing out ideas left and right. And they were just, they would run with it. And, and like I said, it really was, it felt like an ensemble comedy. You know, different episodes put the spotlight perhaps on different members of the class. But in the end, everyone kind of had an identity. Everyone became memorable. You know, in a, in a couple minutes, we'll talk about the episode that you chose to dive deep into for this episode. And I have to believe that this episode is one of your big ones for the whole series because this was all about Maria. You, of course, playing Maria, if we have not yet mentioned that, but a big part of the class from the beginning of the show till the end. The show lasted five seasons, and for most of that time, from the beginning, the teacher in the class was Mr. Moore. He was played by Howard Hessman, who had a pedigree in the sitcom world from WKRP in Cincinnati. What was he like to work with, you know, coming in with all that experience in that genre? Incredibly talented. You know, he came from the theater world as well and was one of the main, like, forefathers that created this theater that came out of San Francisco. You know, he took, he took his craft very seriously and he was a very serious actor and he was in, incredibly involved in the content of the show. And I think what you mentioned earlier was right on. Each character had such depth and context to the char their characters. It was, it was great that they were so established that way. It wasn't in a, written in a frivolous way. It was every single person was so diverse and so had such depth to their personalities and who they were and what their background was and where they came from. I just think it all, it just all came together and made it so interesting. Um, yes, one of the pre predecessors, I, I agree with you, was uh, Welcome Back, Cotter. And I think Room tw 222 was another one of them uh -huh. from, that, from that earlier era. And then I think what followed right after us was Saved by the Bell. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, which, had was... a lot of, which had a lot of success as well. Um, 
you know, and I, what was really kind of strange was I, I don't think we fit into any type of category because we were, we were number, we were a number one television show with the Cosby show back to back. It was either them number one or us number one. We were always, one of us were always in the top one to three. I remember waiting for that phone call every week and saying, where are we on the chart? Um, and Lisa, uh, I'd known since I was seven years old, we did our first commercial together, which was a McDonald's commercial. Lisa Bode. Liloquai. Yeah, Liloquai. Oh. Um, wow. Such a beautiful, stunning girl and beautiful actress and such a gorgeous friend. And I remember thinking to myself how funny it was because we sat around talking about how we were going to be doing something in, in television or film. We knew what, what directions we wanted to go in and we would talk about it. And um, also on that commercial, I think, was a, a guy that was on fa- ended up on Family Ties. It was a smaller world back then with actors. Mm-hmm. We, were, yeah. we were all, there was, there was just a small group of us. Um, there, there was less TV. We, I mean, there's less TV in general. So it's sort of that whole community of people who were, that's right. you know, part of that experience were, was much smaller. Yeah. Right. And you relied on the studios and you relied, you know, there was people that were, there's still people that package today, but when you packaged it back then, I mean, people weren't creating their own content because we didn't have the platform for it. Right. Now we have right. the platform and it's anyone's game, but I was going to say, we didn't really fit into a category because we weren't, in the middle of the 1980s, we're at the tail end, and we weren't really in the 90s. So when they do those flashback kickback shows on, uh, on cable, like, uh, you know, all about the 80s or all about the 90s, we're not fitting into either one of them because I don't even know where, where we are. Either that or, or they forgot to pick it up. That's a, I'm not really that's sure, but we, we were a major show. Yeah. ABC. And, and that's a great point, that, you know, that – you're kind of stuck because, you, and again, you know, we're talking about an episode in a minute here. So I, I'm fresh off of watching that episode yesterday. Before that, I probably haven't seen the show in, in many years. But you're right. It doesn't necessarily feel like an 80s show. It's not quite a 90s show. But I'm kind of curious about the timing because I alluded to this earlier, just sort of the stigma of that brainiac teen or that brainiac type kid that the way it was portrayed in the 80s, you know, how can you not just think of a, something like Revenge of the Nerds and think about those very extreme caricatures that are, you know, quite frankly, pretty derogatory. And, you know, they treat that sort of personality strictly for comedy, making fun of them, not necessarily laughing with them. Did your show feel any of that? Like, did, was it tough to kind of escape that sort of image for, you know, what people would assume your show would be because your show wasn't like that at all. It definitely broke through that mold, but do you think it had a tough time doing so? No, actually, I, I don't think so at all. And I think it was, our, our show came out and it almost um, turned us into rock stars in a weird, bizarre way. And it was, it's kind of like you, you say some um, like orange is the new black or something is the new black. At, at that time, nerds were the new black. It was like we, we came out and made being smart really cool. Mm, cool. Okay. I remember well. getting tons of letters from people saying thank you so much because the person was either antisocial or really shy or introverted or became a hermit because of, of being at the top of their class or being so super intelligent they were skipped a grade or two. And all of a sudden they were considered, they were looked at in a different light. And I remember getting a lot of letters saying, thank you so much. Yeah. I was like, well, you know, it's not just me. It's the writers. It's everybody. It's the directors. It's the producers. It's everybody that come together as a team to create what we create, even, even wardrobe, everything. We all, we all work to do it together. So what ends up on the screen is not a one-person process. Well, hey, let's talk about what ended up on the screen in the episode that you handpicked for us to chat about. I ha- you know, it was deliber- it was over much deliberation, I have to tell you. The Little Shop of Horrors um, episode was such a great episode. That was the one I just told you about with, that I played them a tape that we had done in Westwood in a little booth for Kicks and Giggles. Mm-hmm. And that was such a great episode as well. But, um, but the episode I think that we ended up going with was... Um, all about uh, Maria. 
Was that the one? Uh, yeah, we're talking about season three, episode number ten. And uh, yes, this is, and it's interesting. You know, I got to tell you, this is almost like a case study here because so far in the run of episodes that we've recorded for this show, for the laugh track, almost every episode that's been selected has been from right in the middle of of the run of that particular series. So everyone is kind of going for that middle ground. Yeah, and, and I think it's, I mean, I know you have a very specific reason why this one stood out to you, um, in addition to it being all about Maria. So there's sort of other things at play here, but I feel like that middle ground for a successful show is a place where the show really knows what it is and knows you know what they're doing and everything is firing mm. on all cylinders so it's a great kind of time during the timeline of a series to pick one of the really great episodes so um i think we're, we're right there again right in the prime of head of the class and this one is all about maria but it's also about maria's uh dating life because she for this episode has a very unique boyfriend whom uh we see for this show <laughs> this show only um and of course, we're talking about a guy that we all know, and uh, hey, we all love him. He's Brad Pitt, and I believe you told me when we first started talking about doing this, was this one of his very first TV appearances? Yeah, he. Um, I was with a manager at the time that had the Brat Pack uh, manage the Brat Pack of, of actors. Again, it was it was a small group. Of, uh, of actors around in and around LA at the time and she's still a really good friend of mine she went into a different realm of business her name is Lori Rodkin she's so super cool anyway she had uh, a collection of really interesting actors from Robert Downey Jr. Sarah Jessica Parker Pete Berg even the director Pete Berg was one of them I think Jed Nelson uh, Virginia Madsen gorgeous Virginia I was one of them and she only had like this handful of actors and I was at her office one day, right off of Melrose, and she just that day brought in a new kind of, not an assistant, because they're, they were going to be colleagues who were going to be working together, but Cynthia Pett, who's now Cynthia Pet Dante, came in to work with Lori, and I think she had one client who just did a couple of things, which was Brad, and we were talking about seeing what else that was out there for him, and I said hey, they're casting uh, my boyfriend for this episode coming up. Mm -hmm. And they submitted Brad and got Brad in on an audition. And, uh, and the next thing you know, he was so great to cast him. You know, he's really good. I think in his earlier years, he was underestimated a lot. He, he studied with a brilliant coach named Roy London, who I had gone with Brad to go, you know, just to exercise and, and, to go to class with for for a while and uh you know he came he came from a a well um studied background he wasn't a hack job when it came to going into the industry a lot of a lot of kids were a lot of kids were just like oh hey i'll just do commercials and just kind of fell into it and then there were the, the ones that were a little bit more studied and took it seriously and knew and really believed in our craft and he was one of them as well and he ended up doing the show. It was really weird. I hadn't seen him in a really long time. And I had gotten a small role for a few days on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood with Quentin Tarantino. I was basically just called on it. And there's a funny story behind that, how that happened. Because I'd been doing real estate for the last 18 years. And uh, I saw him for the first time in a really long time. It was just so funny because here we are again, yet on another thing. His career is just taken off in a massive direction and um and mine kind of ebbed and flowed i think i'd i'd done some great things like lost highway and american president and get shorty and i'd done some really fun films great films tv shows countless tv shows and i think it was in and around the 90s where i disappeared for a while i i got married to a rock star and left the country and took off for a while but i still I still did theater. I still acted. I was still acting and came back. I think if I I'd, if I'd probably stayed, I probably would have been more consistent. But I, by that time, I was buying and selling my own real estate with my theatrical money. Mm. And I got my, ended up getting my broker's license. And, and I went with what was 
there at the time. So my career was kind of ebbing and flowing. I ended up on a uh, reoccurring role in CSI and then my reoccurring role in Sopranos. But I'd gotten my broker's license just around then. And I ended up doing all the real estate for everyone on the show on The Sopranos. <laughs> I was like, all right, well, you know, I'm good at this. And I I have vast experience now because I've been buying and selling my own properties, not only here, but internationally. So, yeah, I can help you, of course. Um, first, okay, there's a lot to unpack here. But the first thing I have yeah. to say is that... I am now officially intimidated by you on a whole different level simply because of the <laughs> fact that you, you I, I come from Jersey. I'm, I'm in Jersey right now as we speak, and you're the first person I've ever heard say Sopranos uh, when describing the show. It's it, To all of us here, it's Sopranos. So you are clearly on a different level of culture and intellect, and I bow down to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> but... <laughs> So, uh, and look, I mean... Isn't it you, tomato, tomato? I mean... I, I, well, I, for us, it's... I don't know. We don't really eat vegetables here in Jersey. So, uh, but... <laughs> listen... <laughs> you definitely you know, eat tomatoes. Yeah, that we, we've got a surplus of those. Or is it tomato? I mean, <laughs> First of all, I just want to say that you obviously realize that regardless of comparisons to anybody else or however other careers may have gone, you've had an amazing career and a fascinatingly eclectic one as well. I'm going to just throw it out there. I had no idea that you were in the ele- uh, electric oh, those book crazy loop, dan- breaking, oh, those, those those breaking movies. Crazy dance movies? Well, I was that a dancer. Was... I was a big dancer. I, you know, I came from, from Broadway. I was, I, was a, I was in theater and yeah. uh, doing musicals and stuff. And I was a singer and a dancer. And I really love and appreciate every realm of dance. I've studied everything from ballet, tap, jazz, you name it. Of course, when breakdancing came out, I just had... I just had to learn how to break dance, and I did. I studied with some street dancers because I, I came from Inglewood. I had street dancers all around me, and I remember one time I was going to the clubs, and there was this young rapper named uh, Tracy who called himself Ice-T, and he was my neighbor. Wow. And I was like, can you teach me how to rap? I don't know if I could do that because I'm so white, but, you know, can you teach me how to rap? And he goes, you teach me how to break dance, I'll teach you how to rap. I'm like, deal. And that's how we became friends. We used to go to this crazy club called the Odyssey, and that's where I would practice how to dance. I was the only girl in L.A. that could do windmills. <laughs> Can you still do them? Nuts. Is it still part of your daily routine? Funny enough, because I'm constantly going to the gym and doing these crazy classes, I got to give a shout out to Equinox because I love it so much, but we have these nutty classes sometimes. And, uh, yeah, I can still do it. <laughs> you know, you're in these big rooms on these hardwood floors, and sometimes the classes are just ending or just beginning, and there's no one in there, and you just kind of fool around. Sometimes I do ballet in there, and I'll do chenets across the floor, or I'll turn, I'll do my turns, practice my turns, and then some days I feel like, you know, doing a head spin <laughs> or a back All right. spin. Bring bring us some sort of video <laughs> camera next time. Uh, we're about to go viral. I will. Get, yeah. Send that, I send will. That I will. <laughs> you know, here's the thing. I'm not on any. I'm not on any social media, but I do have video. And I kept thinking to myself, how funny it would be to start up, uploading things. And I thought, well, it would probably kill my career in real estate. I don't think my client, my buyers, and my sellers want to see me doing windmills on it. <laughs> I, I don't see why not. That's what I look for in, in my real estate agent is dance moves. Really? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Not, <laughs> not lying at all about that. Um, uh, listen, hey, so, so we're um, so we're here to talk about the episode, which we've left way far back in the dust. But let, let's hit on it for a minute because this is really, like you said, it's it's all about Maria, and it literally is, and it's really all about your character kind of being pushed and pulled in different directions and trying to figure out where she's going to take a stand and kind of define who she is. Um, and there's two things going on. There's Dennis, who's your classmate who is kind of trying to manipulate you into working on a project with him. 
using your French expertise, which he needs because he doesn't have, mm-hmm. in order to win this award and win this prize money. So he's trying to right. get you to do this fully with the intent of taking all the credit in the end. But he's got that. He's got one side of you. And then, of course, there is your new boyfriend, as we said, played by Brad Pitt. And he is trying to basically make you live his life and do the things he likes to do. He's not comfortable with the intellectual side of you, so you're not really letting on exactly who you really are. You're hiding it from him and kind of dumbing yourself down for him in the beginning of that episode. Yeah, and, you know, again, I want to refer back to the producers, knowing that I spoke French and I went to a French school, utilizing that and integrating it into an episode, which was really cool. They would, they would, they were so open to, to things that we brought to the table. Um, and and I think what was really great about that episode was that, metaphorically, it's basically saying to people, do not change who you are, no matter what, for anybody. Be true to yourself. It's the old proverb, know thyself and to thine own self be true, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not really just the episode saying that. It's not just the the heavens saying that. It's everybody in the class saying that to you. Everybody yelling at you for a time being like, don't, you know, don't fall for Dennis. Don't dumb yourself down for this guy. Like, what are you doing? What are you saying? And meanwhile, you're just kind of acting like you don't understand what your friends are even talking about while the boyfriend is around yeah. and talking and about it's picking and studios. it's picking a side too, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, yeah, you, you know, do I, do I, what direction do I go in? It's you, you have to make your own decisions in life. You can, yeah. you can, you know, objectively it's always good to listen to two diametrically opposite sides of opinions. I believe that. Mm-hmm. And that's what you had in that, that episode. But at the end of the day, if you're true to yourself, and you know yourself really well, you'll make the right decision for yourself because that means you trust yourself. Yeah, and going back to what we talked about earlier about head of the class in general, this is an issue that I think most teens will face at some point, just sort of that identity crisis of how am I going to act, you know, how much of myself am I willing to sacrifice to have certain friends or to have some sort of social status that I want Uh, as opposed to just being true to who you are. And that's a problem that goes well beyond the the gifted and talented class or the advanced, you know, whatever, whatever kind of class that Mr. Moore had that you guys were in. I don't remember exactly what it was labeled, but it's not just about gifted kids or the advanced students. Everybody deals with that. Everybody. And you know what I, I found in my life? coming from such a great school and having such a, a wonderful education and being, you know, I'm grateful for that. But I have found that some people that were raised with the street smarts were smarter in a lot of ways to make really clear decisions just coming from the street. Sometimes that education is better and stronger for you than even an academic education because the academic education can can teach you a lot of things. I mean, I when I got my real estate license, I went back to the Marshall School of Business and at USC and I studied to, I needed to learn what I needed to learn, but that doesn't teach you street smarts. I didn't learn what I needed to learn in the realm of real estate and in business really. I mean, I learned I learned everything academically that I needed to learn. But there's things on the streets that you need to learn and and sometimes you can be smarter by coming from the streets, if yeah. that makes sense. Oh, no, absolutely. It, 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 you know, and it's, it's um, Patsy Roddenberg, who's my Shakespearean um, mentor and, and, and teacher. And she always said, you know, you have to listen, really, really listen, like you're an animal in the dark in the middle of a jungle. Wow. That's and that's, <laughs> I always thought to myself, I, I apply that. I apply that into my business because this business is so shady as well. Like you just do not know who you can trust and you you can get eaten at any time. Are you talking about the entertainment business? Are you talking about the entertainment or the real estate? Yeah. Business. All of it. Life. All of it. Life, business, all of it. And you know, that's represented 
really well on the show, just going back to head of the class a minute, because you have different kids in the class uh, that do come from different backgrounds. And some of them, uh, you know, you could see that it's more of a street smart based uh, intelligence that they bring to the table as opposed to like Alan, who's like the more of like the preppy guy. Um, so like everyone comes from a different place, but they're there because they've shown that they are intellectually capable of hanging in that class without being cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's just a great illustration of exactly what you said in that, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat and there's, you know, more than one kinds of smarts, so to speak. There's, there's different types of intelligence and sometimes some, some types are more useful than others. (laughs) <laughs> and that changes a lot. You know, and some of the smartest people I work with, and I, I work with billionaires, I work with Fortune 500 companies, and I work with, in real estate, and, I, and I, I work with the millennials and people that are the new money, especially in the music industry or entertainment industry. And there's some people that came from the streets that made a lot of money at a very young age. And they're incredibly smart, because, and they're smarter because they've surrounded themselves with really smart people as well that are advising them, but they know that, I mean, they know when someone's trying to, um, you know, they just, they, they know if someone's not being real, if someone's not, if someone's not telling them the truth, if someone is trying to sell them, if someone is trying, they, they can see right through it. Yeah. That's street smarts. That's just that common sense that you get from being kind of out there in the, the veritable jungle in the dark, so to speak, and having to, I guess, sure. be defensive against all that. Yeah. And, and having been there, <laughs> you know. Absolutely, yeah. So looking at this episode, you know, we know where it's going to go. Of course, in the end, the, the, the paper is going to get written. It's going to win the award. Dennis tries to take the credit, and you end up, uh, Maria stands up for herself and, you know, in front of an audience when this award is going down. And basically it is revealed forcibly that you were uh, a big part of that award and deserving of part of yeah part of the yeah exactly and and um and i made the choice i made the choice to but it wasn't taking it was it wasn't it was interesting i didn't um come to either peer pressure from my class and i didn't succumb to the pressure of i was true to myself at the end and uh and stood up for what was right yeah and and said, Look, you can't you can't take complete you know you can't take credit for my work and yes, I'm saying this in front of the guy that I really like, but at the end of the day, truth is truth, and let's be honest. The the show treated the relationship between you and uh, and the character played by Brad Pitt as a pretty kind one. They didn't just turn him into this jerk who storms off and says, you know, forget you. If you're going to be smart, I don't want to be with you or anything like that. It was really just more of a mutual admission or maybe some more on his part, but sort of a recognition that this just wasn't necessarily going to be a good fit. And it wasn't just that you weren't good for him. I think it was that he realized he wasn't necessarily going to be fulfilling for you either. So it was this very mutual, nice thing that I... I you and it was really built. smart what he said. It, it's really, it was actually, in the end, very smart what he says. You can only be as smart as you. What was it? Um, you, I think you you have a better take on it than I do because you you. I'm going back by memory. Um, it's something about you, you can only be as smart as you are, or you can't be. You can only be as smart as you already are. I think it was. What's the yeah, line? I, I don't remember exactly. I just remember that part of it was you're not going to be dumber for me, and I'm certainly not getting any smarter. <laughs> I remember that part. <laughs> yeah out to me but it was i don't think it's the idea of like duh like i'm an idiot it's more just you know we're kind of we have different we have different viewpoints on life you know it was hammered home a a few times during this episode that he was really into football and the three stooges so that was kind of a good illustration of where he was (laughs) and he and one of his lines which is brilliant we're putting on this planet to party yeah (laughs) (laughs) Very, yeah, yeah, that was a highlight, definitely. He just, you know, that was his philosophy. That was the most passionate thing that he had said during the whole episode, and it was honest and true to the character. And, and a know, great way of thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't argue with it, quite honestly. I mean, I think there's kind of room <laughs> yeah. for 
<laughs> I kind of feel that way more yeah. now, you know, than than ever. But uh, you know, you guys had that thing <laughs> throughout the episode where he would point to you and just say you, and then you would point to him and say you, and that was sort of like your your hello, your goodbye, your shalom, like everything all encompassed in one <laughs> word. So I think that was a great It was like a barucha. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the simplicity of it, it was, was so brilliant. Yeah, it was. I mean, w look, this is a character, I, you know, this goes back to, you know, what you said about Brad Pitt and how talented he really is, which to this day people probably don't give him enough credit for. But, I mean, between that and the writing and, of course, your performance, we got this fully fleshed out relationship and this fully fleshed out new character. And we got to know both of them really well and understand them well, all within the confines of one 22 or, or so minute episode. So that's, that's mm -hmm. pretty good stuff. Yeah. And it was fun. I mean, we had a blast. And I think at the end of the day... That's what it, it really is. It, it, if you're not loving and having a great time in doing what you do, then you shouldn't be doing it. It's got to be a labor of love. Would you go you got to really love what you do. If, if you had an opportunity to go back to that particular world, to the sitcom world, because you've done so many different types of things, you know, from, from theater to, you know, all different types of movies and, and te television, but you haven't really been back in that sitcom world. Is that something that would appeal to you at this stage of the game? I would say, why not? It depends on the writing, and it depends on if, if I connect with the material or not, but I would say, why not to everything? Because it doesn't, it doesn't matter what, um, what category it falls into. If you connect with the material and you can you can tell the story and be honest and truthful in, in delivering what you're, you're communicating what you're saying, um, then you're going to then you're going to connect. You, the audience is going to connect with you. I would say, yeah, why not? I say, why not? That's awesome. It, it, it was such a fun thing to do, and I did it for so long. What do you think would have to and happen? I, and I enjoy it. <laughs> what do you think would have to happen? to bring the head of the class back in 2020 because everyone is finding a way to bring, you know, shows back, whether it's an update of the characters or just rebooting with all new characters. It obviously couldn't be the same show because times have changed, but what kind of show? Yeah. I mean, look, look what happened with Beverly Hills 90210. I was, I was in the season pilot and I remember it was blasted all over social media. Where's Marianne Moore? I was Jason Priestley's love interest in the two-hour pilot. Hmm. And everyone was wondering where I was and why didn't they bring me back. And I think, that, I think that you're right. I think everyone's doing this kind of like kickback comeback and bringing it back in a weird way. Um, and, I, you know, who knows? If it was done really well, if it was written really well, I think it would... I think it would take writing writing the script out and figuring out where the characters are now. If someone's a teacher now or if someone is, um, who knows where everybody went. I, you know, just like all the people in their personal lives went in different directions from the show, it would be the same thing. Like, where would these characters go? Where, where would life take them? Where would they take their lives? Okay. And then bringing them all together and writing something out that was so interesting and so fun and so fascinating that people would just connect with it. So you know, going it, from from high school. Uh huh. Here's the nerdy fan question. Um, I got to ask: Where's Maria in 2020? You know better than anybody at this <laughs> point. Where do you think she is? Probably where I am. <laughs> is that really so, that character was so close to me? You know. Okay, it's a great answer. I mean, from your perspective, it sounds like there was a lot of the performers in the characters, so maybe that's true, uh, you know, logically speaking for a lot of those characters, that they would end up kind of being altered versions of where everybody actually is, where that show to... Well, yeah, and it, it, exactly, like, you know, doing that little singing thing and then uh, with, in Westwood on a whim and having come from musical theater and then the producers writing Little Shop of Horrors around me and then I ended up singing at Lincoln Center. 
I sang um, I sang some classics by Chopin and I it's some opera and I also sang some pieces of the Hunchback of Notre Dame that was being turned into a musical at the time. And I, I, I've gone into so many different directions in my life. I don't, I don't know. I don't remember an episode where Maria specifically said that she had a goal of becoming or going in one direction. And I, I remember thinking that after the show ended, wow. Um, why wasn't that addressed? Why weren't, why weren't the kids asked, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? Does one kid want to go into aerodynamics and build something for the military, for their planes? Does, does somebody want to go, you know, or engineering? Clearly, Arvid was going to MIT. We already knew that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but really, that would have been a really interesting thing to address, and then we would know where they all are. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, that's something that that these days would be addressed, if not on the show, then it would be addressed on a website or on exclusive content made for, uh, for digital or for Netflix or something. Like, there's so many other ways that they almost create fan fiction to extend the stories that you see um, from the base shows or the base content. But they didn't really do that back then. So They, they didn't do that. And I think that, I, I think that if... if Arvid, for instance, said, hey, I want to go into aerodynamics or go into air engineering and build spacecraft for our military. That would have been something that, you, that, if, that would answer your question. Where would we be? That's, that's where Arvid would be if one of the other characters said, well, I want to go into poetry and study, you know, like uh, that would be a great Simone character because she loved poetry and, and maybe she became the next um, the, or, or a painter, some, something in the creative or poetic realm because, you know, she could have been the female C.S. Lewis. Who knows? And then another character said, well, I want to be a realtor like my mom. And then another character said, well, I want to, you know, it's, but we didn't have that. And I think, um, I think that that would answer your question, but it would take someone, it'd probably take a writer to write it out. Look, I think you and I can handle this. It's not too late. We're going to make this happen. <laughs> um, oh, Yeah. It, well, but here's the thing, though. I think in order to get the attention of people we need to get the money behind this thing, you're going to have to incorporate breakdancing into the future of Maria. So <laughs> that's going to be sure. part of the demo. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> it seems like a can't-miss deal. Come on. Netflix needs more content, clearly. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> hey, listen. I'll do pirouettes I, across the floor into a, into a backspin. All right. Look, yeah. I'm not. I'm not betting against it. You know, I'm not betting against any show finding a way to, to find a future these days. Head of the class, I think it would be so much fun. But either way, I mean, this has been so much fun. It's been so great to catch oh, up with so you. Oh, so much fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. Now, this is kind of weird because I usually say, "Hey, how do you want people to follow you on social media, etc." You don't have any of that, so do you want people to just leave you the hell alone, or or what exactly are we looking at? Here? <laughs> no, I'm 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 actually creating um I'm I'm creating an Instagram page as we speak. I haven't gone public with it yet, but I'm creating an Instagram page, and so it's going to have all kinds of fun stuff to follow in my real estate. And I and I actually started filming several years ago and putting all all the film, filming things that I've been doing together. Um, I explore the great architects and um, you're going to see some amazing architecture from whether it's Geary and I speak in great detail and length about them as well. And we get to explore uh, these, these wonderful, masterful national heritage landmark buildings and things like that. And I walk through and I think it's something that people would find fascinating. We don't have a lot of history and culture in our country because we're just so young but when we do find it it's so interesting and i've sold so so many properties that were built by the great architects and i started um just filming it and putting some together together some really cool pieces and i'm going to be um putting those pieces up out on social media so people can can explore and see what i get to do on a daily basis which is which is have the luxury of exploring these fine pieces of art that are 
presented, you know, in and around, hidden, and around little crevices around our city here. You know, you have you have so much more to see in New York. It's just, what are you, 350 years old compared to what, we're 250 years old. There's a little bit more in New York. Um, and then, of course, when you go into different countries, you get uh, just some glorious, glorious architecture. But it's it's fun to explore what I found here, whether it's a Quincy Jones, whether it's a Geary, whether it's um, a Frank Lloyd Wright. It, they're all really fascinating to explore and um, and that's going to be exciting to bring to the public because I think people would be really excited to see if if they're interested in that they'll be really excited to see it. So I've been I've been filming that a lot and selfie filming it and 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 professionally filming it as well. That's great. That's great. And look, I mean, it sounds like something that people are going to want to give a try. I, I'm not an architecture guy, but I am very interested over the past five minutes, just thanks to your description. So I think that uh, I think that it's going to be a fun ride and we will look out for that Instagram page when when it comes out and we'll pass the word. Yeah. Along. So, yeah, that'll be cool. And, um, you know, until then. And like you said before, we're just put on this earth to party. So we, we... <laughs> I didn't say it, but hey, I think it's it's a fun quote to go by. And um, if you if you think of a good script of how to bring the show back, um, yeah, I think that would be fun. Okay, <laughs> it's a deal. Likewise, likewise, because I want in. <laughs> um, I'll play. I'll the call. I'll call the something. clan. <laughs> yeah, nice. yeah. I'm still friends with everybody, so I'll call everybody, get everyone together. We just, we actually just um, got together for Dan's birthday at his house. We were all oh. there. Nice, nice, and every, yeah. you know, it's it, it's what a talented cast too. We didn't even talk about that, but you know, so many people who have gone on to be involved in such a diverse array of different things in and out of entertainment you know from mm-hmm. being behind the cameras and producing and like you guys as a whole have really been uh like a, a driving force in a lot of really great stuff that people may or may not even know about um you know as far as relation to to dan and to you know just different things that you guys have done it's it's pretty amazing this body of work and it's fun, and it's fun to explore. Like, you know, you were saying this thing about being in a genre of the sitcom world. You look at Big Bang Theory, brilliant, brilliantly written, brilliantly directed, brilliant. The acting is absolutely outstanding. The comedic timing is astonishing because it's so brilliant. And, you know, you think of some of these sitcoms, and, and they're so, they can transform you because you go into it not knowing what to expect, and then you, then you end up learning so much. Yeah, I, you and know, laughing every, at the same time, <laughs> and making a lot of other people laugh too. Not only millions around the world, but the people right in front of you. And it's a cool thing to celebrate that kind of dual talent to be able to entertain both in the room and out in the world. And that's something that you and the cast of Head of the Head of the Class did for five years, and we're still loving it. So, I, again, Yay. thank you so Is much. Is it a cult for, classic? It's, I think it's more than a cult classic. I just think it's a classic. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's so well, awesome. You know, if you ever get a hankering for talking about a different episode, I know that you had a two or three under consideration, but it'd be great to have you back and do this again because, I mean, I think we just kind of scratched the surface of what we could talk about here. Oh, yeah. Let's do Little Shop of Horrors next time. That was fun. Okay. Well, I'll pick another episode. Yeah, we'll we'll pick a couple and we'll chat about it. You're you've been wonderful. It's been so such a absolute complete pleasure getting to know oh. you and speaking with you and connecting with you. You too. Thank you so much, man. Let's uh let's hey, let's end this show on a high note. We're going to go and party and uh, we're going <laughs> to see you next time. Have fun. Keep laughing. Guys, the Laugh Track podcast is produced and hosted by me, Jerry Strauss, with editing and additional production by our buddy Steve Prentice. We will be expanding in the next few weeks, guys, so keep a lookout for all kinds of big announcements. In the meantime, if you want to drop me a line, please do so. Let me know what you think of the show, comments, questions, complaints, suggestions. Just do so, please. You can reach me at laughtrackpod at outlook.com, old-fashioned email, and Twitter. 
We are on Twitter, so please uh, hit us up there. Laugh Track TV is the handle there. And again, our Facebook page as well. The Laugh Track with Jerry Strauss Facebook page is out there. We encourage you to like it and stay in touch with us that way as well. And please, wherever you get your podcast, wherever, however you are hearing this show, please subscribe. It'll ease you of the responsibility of having to remember when this show comes out, having to download it. It's going to be there automatically for you as soon as we drop new episodes. So go ahead. It's free. There's no better bargain than free. So please do that. And while you're out there, please consider leaving a review that helps us greatly. And tell a friend. Tell two. Tell as many people as you think might be interested in this show. We have a lot of fun here. We want more and more people to join in on that fun. Until next time, folks, thank you so much for checking us out. I am Jerry Strauss. Stay safe out there. Stay well. And we'll see you next time.